Welcome to Gay Fairfax, the national capital area's only weekly gay cable magazine sharing news, views, and pride. I'm Barry Forbes. And I'm Dave Hughes. Each week, we'll feature events and personalities of interest to the gay women and men of Northern Virginia. On this edition, we'll stock the halls of the Virginia State House with members of Virginians for Justice, which is a statewide gay lobbying group. And we'll learn of the comfort and support available to lesbians with cancer at the new Mary Helen Mountner Project. But first, here's this week's gay trivia question with Peg McCraw. I'm Peg McCraw with this, this week's trivia question. In what animals has homosexuality been observed and formally studied? Thank you, Peg. The gay men and women in Virginia are denied many rights and protections which are enjoyed by non-gays and other minorities. But a statewide gay lobbying group called Virginians for Justice is trying to change all that. One of their strategies is to encourage citizens like you and me to lobby their representatives in Richmond. In fact, I followed Kevin Nitz, who is the president of the Fairfax Lesbian and Gay Citizens Association, as he stalked the halls of the State House and seeking justice for all gay Virginians. The Virginia State House in Richmond is the source of many laws which discriminate against all gay Virginians. One organization is focusing in on changing those laws. The statewide gay lobbying network called Virginians for Justice. As part of its legal reform strategy, Virginians for Justice coordinated a citizens lobbying day which began with training at St. Paul's Church, just a block away from the State House. Over 20 gay citizens joined in the lobbying day, including Kevin Nitz, president of the Fairfax Lesbian and Gay Citizens Association, and Harry Shepler, a member of the board of directors. The chair of Virginians for Justice, Bruce Nielsen, led the training and briefed the citizen lobbyists on the current issues before the Virginia legislature. We have been doing a lot. For example, on the ABC issue, we've met with governor's aides, and in fact, we were there first thing this morning. We have met with the ABC board, all three appointed members of the ABC board. Letters have been written to all 20 members of the General Laws Committee in the House of delegates and the members of the law committee in the Senate. Uh, there have been many personal contacts by board members with the various delegates. Uh, I think they're, they know us. When I went to the Creating Change conference that NGLTF had a couple years ago, there was a group from Indiana. That's a Republican state. They've been able to achieve a lot for gay rights by being there year in and year out, quietly working you have to come back every year. I think one of the things we have to remember is we're not going to achieve wonderful things in one effort. Uh, I think it protects us that there's this kind of glacial pace of change. If we could change things overnight, unfortunately that means that Pat Robertson or other people of that type could change things easily too. The fact that the system change, changes slowly is a bother but it really, I think, works to our benefit in the long run. And I think most of the delegates and senators are decent people. Although, um, I think one of the important things we got from our lobbyists last year was the information, which is pretty common sense. Uh, we have a few friends, we have a few enemies, but for the most part, the people up in the General Assembly don't know who we are, don't know what our concerns are, and probably have, most of them haven't met any openly gay people from their district. We have three issues that we've chosen as our priorities. I, I would suggest that those are options you might consider and to discuss. Although any personal experience that people have, personal concerns, obviously if there are things that you care about, that concern is going to come across to the delegate or senator. And that's important too. We're not trying to... Uh, impose our views necessarily on you, but we would suggest ABC reform, AIDS, and hate crimes is the three issues that we think are pretty important. Hate crimes is something where we're really educating them, 
and we're trying to gather information. For Virginians for Justice hopes to establish a toll-free hotline within a few months so that there will be a place where people can report incidences of gay bashing and other sexual orientation related hate crimes. Unfortunately, I think the fact of life is that we have to gather statistics to prove to these people that it is a real problem and one that warrants their concern. Pat Heck has done a lot of the work on the ABC issue, and so I think I'll turn it over to him now. Virtually all legislators will agree that the statutes are ridiculous and they don't want to tackle the issue. The rationale will be based upon the fact that the legislator's valuable time, especially this session, uh, is taken up by budget problems. So they're not going to want to tackle this issue because they feel it has negligible impact. Another argument uh, that you'll hear from somebody who's sympathetic is that uh, they, they don't want to vote for something like this because they're from a conservative district. If they're, you know, unsympathetic, you can uh, still ask you know, possibly if we had a bill introduced that did not specifically remove homosexuality from the list of people that are included in the ABC laws, but change the wording to, to you know, people who um, are conducting lewd and lascivious behavior or something like that, would they will be willing to support it? That's, uh, we would still consider that uh, acceptable It'd be nice if it just out and out said homosexuality, remove that, the, if the bill was worded so, to just remove that from the statutes. But uh, if we can't get that, we can always try for just a rewording that doesn't point fingers. After we met with the ABC board a couple of weeks ago, they said that they expect a general rewrite of ABC laws, possibly including the privatization issue. But there are a lot of outdated things in there, and they want to change it. And they were considering doing some of it this year, but after our meeting this morning with the governor's aide, it, it looks like there's not going to be much of a chance for any re general rewriting of ABC laws. If, if you want to talk to your delegate or senator about AIDS to mention these things, um, a lot of them should be familiar with it because of all the legislation that's, that's gone through and been proposed in the last few years. In, in the background section, uh, he's listed uh, the, uh, the major laws that have been uh, passed and, and what they deal with uh, with respect to the, to the Department of Health. If you're from Northern Virginia, you might be familiar with the, the problems with the Ryan White Memorial Care Bill. Um, you might want to read that section, evidently. Um, the District of Columbia used Northern Virginia's metropolitan area, or, or their population, to, is, was included in the Northern, in the uh, District of Columbia statistics in order to uh, be uh, eligible for Title I recipients of, of Ryan White funds. And D.C. evidently is getting all the money, uh, even though they used, uh, you know, however many millions of people live in Northern Virginia, I suppose a couple million. And, uh, it's a good idea to make your legislators aware of this fact so that uh, they can uh, start pushing for Northern Virginia to get that money. It's a federal issue, but the state government is the one that needs to push for it. I'd like to make a few personal comments about uh, how one lobbies. I don't claim to have any uh, great corner on knowledge, but I think the first thing is don't be afraid uh, don't think that you're imposing. These people were elected to represent the citizens of Virginia. We're citizens. We have just as much right to call on them as anyone else. We do need to be concise. They are busy. This is a short session. A lot's happening. We can't expect a lot of time. Uh, if you can't see the delegate or senator and can see an aide, that's not terrible. Often they're more receptive, more informed, uh, and the word will get to the senator or delegate. Don't feel like you're being put off. It's just a fact of life. It's important, I think, in general to focus, if you can, on one or two issues. But as I said, I think what we're really aiming for is education. Fully briefed, Kevin Nitz and Harry Shepler walk the shady block from the church to the General Assembly building, office complex for the Virginia delegates and senators. 
Kevin and Harry have the greatest task among all the citizen lobbyists to track down and speak with the county's 16 delegates and senators all in the space of one workday. The first legislator on is Delegate Alan Mayer, whom they catch between committee meetings and the General Assembly session scheduled for one o'clock that day. In these tight budget times, we're all facing the reality that something's got to give, but to ask that you please support as much continued AIDS funding as possible, and also to talk a little bit farther down road in terms of gathering statistical information on hate crimes in general in the state, but also anything that would be gathered that would also target sexual orientation. It, but one of the concerns we would have is that right now we have an enlightened governor and legislature that down the road we may not be as fortunate and in any sort of rewrite the ability to do some changing in the law might not be there. Understand? Okay. We Throughout the day, Kevin and Harry are frequently met with empty offices and legislative aides. So those are the three areas that we're here today addressing with our various senators and delegates. Oh, right. Well, I'm sorry you missed Senator huh. Sasswell, but right. I will I be sure I've written the three Thank points you. down, and I will be sure also, that he um, gets this information. Um, sometimes the lawmaker's aides keep them standing in the hallways, and sometimes they actually invite them in to hear what they have to say. We'd hope that I know in these tight budgetary times that we could preserve the funding that's been appropriated for the AIDS programs statewide and in Northern Virginia especially. We are seeing the impact, one of the two areas of the state mostly that are being impacted, that we would hope that we could continue to keep the funding intact. And then the last area that we're just calling attention to is the need to gather hate crime statistics statewide. And one of the things that I, we would ask that if that information is gathered by the Commonwealth, that they would include information against individuals based on their sexual orientation. And sometimes aides are actually helpful. We're also here today asking for support from our delegates to continue AIDS funding in Northern Virginia. We're one of the regions in the Commonwealth that's most infect, uh, impacted by it, as well mm -hmm. as has a high infection rate, impacted with it, that we continue the funding for the local programs there. Right. And then also... I know that Ms. Excuse me, I just okay. interrupt for a moment. Sure. Mrs. Byrne is uh, working on a, a measure to um, have a tax relief for uh, Meals on Wheels programs. Oh. I feel in the tight budget year that any new program right. is mm -hmm. likely to meet with, you know, opposition. And and those who would oppose this on other grounds will certainly use as that a funding. as a funding as a as something they will say, which will be partially true this year. But exactly. It, so you won't it won't smoke people out. Though. Yeah, that's I, what I'm saying. I mean, it's like we're coming here trying to encourage support, but yet we realize too it's very tight fiscal times right. for well, everyone. Well, but the support the support is more. I mean, obviously money is the real support, mm -hmm. but support is more than that. I mean, it's good for you in to know who your friends are, right? and also then when money is looser, and money will be looser Exactly. Again, then, then, you know, you'll know who's the choir and who's not in the exactly. choir. Exactly. After wandering the halls for hours, Kevin and Harry reflect on their progress. Seems to be going pretty well. What do you think? Real good. Um, everyone seems to be receptive to our cause. No one has given a negative response so right. far. I've been real pleased in our meeting with Delegate Mayor primarily. I think we were very fortunate to catch him in and he was quite receptive to us, but I think also too the eight legislative aides we've spoken to have also been quite responsive too. Yes, they all have. Up until now, the Virginia State House has denied equal rights and protections to its gay citizens. Fortunately, there is hope for the future. With the involvement of citizens like Kevin and Harry, Virginians for Justice is working for the day when Virginia truly grants liberty and justice for all. Each week when you tune into Gay Fairfax, you see only a small portion of the crew that really makes this show happen. Camera operators, 
floor directors, lighting technicians, directors, technical directors. These are the people who really produce Gay Fairfax. If you'd like to join our crew, please write to us in care of the Fairfax Lesbian and Gay Citizens Association, Post Office Box 2232, Springfield, Virginia 22152. Or call us at area code 703-451-9528. Discrimination often prevents gay women and men from receiving the proper health care and support. The few services available to gays are devoted overwhelmingly to HIV or AIDS among gay men. The Mary Helen Mountner Project seeks to provide information and support to lesbians affected by cancer. Michelle Michaels learned how the Mountner Project helps lesbians to cope with the cancer in their lives. Thank you, Becky Carroll and Jeanette Paroli with, for being with us today. So tell me, what exactly is the Mountner Project? The Mary Helen Mountner Project for Lesbians with Cancer um, is a project designed to do a couple of major things. Um, one is to make living with cancer easier for lesbians and their partners and family. The other thing is to make asking help a little, for help a little bit easier. Um, it was started as the result of Mary Helen Mountner who was a lesbian feminist attorney in the D.C. area. She was dying of breast cancer and mentioned to her partner that she thought it would be really great to start a project such as it is to be able to give assistance to lesbians and their family who are dealing with this. After Mary Helen died, Susan Hester started the project by calling together a bunch of friends. That was just about a year ago, and since then the project has grown just in leaps and bounds where we have over 70 volunteers. We've worked with 17 families of lesbians who've had cancer and we're doing going great guns. Well tell me there are so many cancer groups out there now why one specifically for lesbians? Well I think that there are several issues that that lesbians have to address, lesbians with cancer have to address in their families that straight women do not. When you consider that one in three American women will get cancer in her lifetime and you figure that approximately 10% of the population are lesbian and probably more in, in the Washington metropolitan area. There are certain things you need to look at. One is that lesbians that are much higher risk for ovarian, for um, cervical and for breast cancer. And the reason is that women who um, have children by the time they're 30 reduce the odds of getting cancer because of certain biological changes that the body goes through um, in the birth process and, and in, in pregnancy. So number one, she's at a, we're at a higher risk for getting those kinds of cancer. And number two, um, lesbians in general are less likely to go to a gynecologist on a regular basis for a pap smear and for mammograms. And again, the reason being is that um, what frequently happens when you go to the gynecologist's office is they're going to say, well, what kind of birth control do you use? And it means basically coming out to their physicians. For a lot of women, that's a very difficult problem to deal with. There are other reasons. When you think about those women that do die of cancer, and I think it was 25% um, of women who get breast cancer, white women who get breast cancer, will not live more than five years. And 40% of black women who get breast cancer will not live more than five years. When you look at those statistics as an example, the woman whose partner dies of cancer, who does she go to to express what her needs are and who does she go to for support? There are issues involved, for example, that if her, if her money is combined with her, with her lover and the lover died, very often if they're in a joint account, she has to pay taxes on her own money because there's no legal issue to, to clarify whose money is who because we don't have a legal relationship. And these are issues that lesbians have to deal with, that the straight population does not necessarily have to deal with in the same way. Most women, statistically it shows anyway, get married at some point in their life. And at least they have the choice of being covered by their husband's uh, medical insurance. How does, the, items like that. how does the project, or the women in the project, help with things like this? Do they inform the women, counsel them, or, or what? What goes on? Well, there's a couple of different ways that the project is going through and, and dealing with this. One is there is a direct services group that does provide direct services, helping women fill out insurance papers, um, providing a way for either the lesbian with cancer or her partner or her, her close friends to kind of blow off steam and say, I'm up to here and I mm -hmm. don't know how I'm going to keep going. Um, to help with walking the dog and helping make appointments or accompany to appointments. 
There's also a whole segment of the project that is working to do education to the lesbian community about health care issues so that we can be more aware of what these things are that we need to be watching out for. The third component of the project is um, the Mountner Project is working to do education um, and outreach to the healthcare community so that they are better informed about what the issues are for lesbians and their family members who are dealing with cancer. So, so it can be something as simple as when you're taking a, a history, uh, frequently a doctor will say, well, what does your husband think of that? And what the doctor has to be informed of is say, what does your partner think of that? What, so that husband and wife are not automatically used. So that the assumption of heterosexuality is not put in there so that, the lesbian, so that we do not have to feel um, that we're not included. And we're much more likely, if I, if I get a sense that my physician is, is not assuming heterosexuality, I'm much more likely to feel comfortable coming out to her and say, these are my needs. And so one of the things that we really want to do is inform the health community about what they can do to make um, health care more accessible to lesbians and more user friendly. Mm -hmm. I think there's another piece too and that is as lesbians we are so independent and we think we can take care of everything ourselves. And one of the things that happens is when something as massive as cancer comes in and interferes with already hectic daily schedules, it makes it that much harder to pull it all together. Um, it's very difficult to ask for help. This keeps coming up again and again, particularly for the lesbian who is dealing with cancer in her very own body. She's already feeling vulnerable and um, like things are out of control. And many times we're finding that those of us who are the partners are screaming for help and saying, please, can we have some help? So one of the things that we're trying to do within the project is make sure that we all know it's okay to ask for help and we're all going to help each other at some point or time. In I think it's an issue of redefining the word family. Um, another thing that, that a lot of other cancer treatment or cancer support groups don't deal with is the family. We're not just talking about each, each of us is a lesbian, we're talking about our partners, we're talking about our extended family. And that's one of the things about this program that's very important. We do not just only offer mm -hmm. services to the lesbian with cancer. We offer services to her partner, her friends, anyone who is part of her support system that really needs some, some issues that need to be addressed. We're pretty creative and we're very flexible about what we'll do. Um, it can be grief and bereavement support. It can be sitting in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles getting the woman's car registration renewed. Um, it can be helping women who are faced with hair loss from radiation and chemo treatments know where the best place is to get a wig, wig and how then to even deal with it so that it's styled not to look like something out of frump heaven, <laughs> but something that feels a little bit more normal. How does uh, someone contact the Mountainer Project? Um, we have a phone line, mm -hmm. and you can call the Mountainer phone line, which is area code 202-332-5536. And what will happen is a project volunteer will collect those messages, and the phone call will be returned within 24 hours. Great. Mm -hmm. This number is also listed in the blade, isn't it? It's Under, listed uh, in the blade. The services. Under services. There is also a P.O. box that I don't know what it is. I can tell you. Okay. Um, you can also contact the Mountner Project at P.O. Box 90437, Washington, D.C., 20090. And I should put a plug in that we are now tax deductible. We have that uh, 501c3 status, and if you want to help financially, that is always a wonderful thing to do. If you want to help by volunteering, we have a, a whole bunch of tasks that we would love to have people join us in. For anybody that's got a flexible schedule and can help us during the day to accompany to doctor's appointments or run errands or whatever, it would be most, most helpful. Well, I hope our viewers will call. I hope and so, And I too. thank you for being here and for the service you're providing. It's We've enjoyed it. Thank you. Television can certainly keep you company, but why not try the three-dimensional kind of company? Make new friends by stepping out occasionally. Here are just a few of the upcoming events from the Gay Fairfax Date Book.
Well, how did you do with this week's gay trivia question? Here's Peg with the answer. And now the answer to our trivia question. Homosexuality has been observed in lions, male, seagulls, female, and in monkeys, both male and female. Don't forget that you can tune into Gay Fairfax every single week at this time. Here's what's coming up in the next few weeks. That wraps up this edition of Gay Fairfax. We'll close this show with a performance by Pamela Stanley from the 1990 DC Gay Pride Day Festival. Pamela is singing, Coming Out of Hiding. For Gay Fairfax, I'm Dave Hughes. And I'm Barry Forbes. Thank you for joining us. Remember to keep the pride alive.